So it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the CRM Applied Math Seminar, Dr. Andrews Giraldo. Um, Dr. Giraldo is a mathematician uh, specializing in dynamical systems theory. Um, he's, he's joining us today from, uh, from Auckland, uh, New Zealand, where he's a research fellow at the Department of Mathematics, as well as the Dogwall Center for Photonics and Quantum Technologies. Um, and Dr. Giraldo got his uh, PhD a few years ago from the University of Auckland. He's, he's won a few awards, including the Red Sox uh, Award from Siam uh, Dynamical Systems uh, Conference. And to the best of my knowledge, he's, uh, he's among the wizards of uh, using numerical continuation methods, uh, especially when using Octo. Um, so I'll so, so without further ado, I'll uh, Andrews, the floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Perus, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, also thank you very much for coming to my talk and allowing me to have this presentation today. So in today's talk, I'm gonna talk about one of the main projects I have been involved uh, during my time as a research fellow at the University of Auckland and the Double Center for Photonics and Quantum Technologies. Uh, this project deals with understanding the operation of a quantum optical device, uh, which is made of photonic crystal nanocavities. Uh, so for the people who may not know, uh, photonic crystal is a thin layer of indium phosphide where you drill holes in a periodic fashion. Now, if you drill holes in a proper way, you can actually change the optical properties of this thin layer of indium phosphide, and you can make uh, photonic insulators out of them. What I mean by this is that if you were to pump light to this thin layer of indium phosphide, then light will be reflected. Now, as some of you might have realized, this setup is quite strong because then you can take holes away from these periodic lattice, and then you can create a plethora of new optical devices. Now, here on the right, I'm showing you the particular device that I'm going to talk to you about today. These are two couple of photonic crystal nanocavities. So here you can see that we have this periodic lattice of holes, and I take holes away from two particular regions here, which I'm just symbolizing it here. Uh, now, if I take holes away from these two regions, I'm going to have two defects slash cavities. And now if I were to pump light into this particular device, light is gonna be trapped in these uh, cavities and each cavity is actually gonna behave as a, photon, as a photonic resonator. Now, the interesting thing about this device is that given the separation of these two cavities, these two photonic resonators are gonna be coupled. Now, this particular ex, uh, uh, this, uh, experimental device is designed and manufactured by Dr. Alejandro Giacomotti's group at C2N in France, which are our experimental collaborators in this project. Uh, some, uh, another interesting thing about this particular device is that they are really small. Uh, the holes, for example, they are, they are of the order of nano, uh, the radius of the holes are of the orders of nanometers. And, and because of their small size, uh, they actually operate, operate with a low number of photons. And due to this low number of photon operation, a lot of people in the quantum optical community have seen this particular experimental setup as a possible realization of a dissipative two-side boson haber dammer model, which is a quant uh, fundamental quantum optical model that a lot of people are interested in. Uh, so our contribution in this particular project was to try to understand what kind of dynamics one could observe from this particular device. Uh, for these purposes, uh, we wanted to uh, study a little bit this two, uh, dissipative two-side post Hubbard dimer model. However, this uh, quantum optical model is quite uh, difficult to study analytically or even get a, a good grasp of what is happening. So what we did was to take the semi-classical approximation of this particular model. And what I mean by this is that you, can, you have an algorithm that allows to start from this quantum optical model, actually derive as a system of or ordinary differential equation, which are valid in the thermodynamic limit. Basically, it will, they, will, they are valid as the number of photons is large inside the cavity, inside the number of photons trapped inside the cavities is large. Now, uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, this particular system of ODs that is derived uh, from this two side boson Haber dammer model. Uh, here, A represents the light field that is trapped in one of the cavities. 
while P represents the lactose trapped in the other cavity. Uh, in this particular setup, uh, we, we have three parameters, uh, F, kappa, and delta. F will represent the injection amplitude of the light uh, that is being pumped into the device. Uh, delta is the detuning, or basically means that is the difference between the frequency of the resonators and the frequency of the input signal. And kappa is the coupling strength between the two cavities. All right. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, the Alejandro's group is, was actually interested in the situation where uh, the two cavities were identically designed and also in the situation where you were pumping the same amount of light in both cavities. So for this reason, both delta, kappa, and f is the same for, for a and b. Now, uh, uh, as some of you might think, this is uh, because a and b are complex numbers. What we have here is a two-dimensional complex vector field or a four-dimensional real vector field. And not only that, uh, this particular system of ODs are C to H variant. And what I mean by this is like if you permute A and B, then you're gonna get the same, uh, the same equations of, of two transformations. Uh, now, uh, what we now want to tackle now that we have this ODE is to try to understand for a fixed value of kappa, uh, what kind of dynamics can be observed as I'm changing F and Delta. So basically uh, I'm interested in understanding the bifurcation structure of this system of ODEs. Now, why do we fix uh, Kappa? Well, uh, you can imagine that Alejandro's group can design uh, a bunch of samples of different uh, photonic crystal nanocavities and depend on each, uh, let's say uh, the, the characterized, characterized, characterizing feature of each of these devices is the coupling strength, right? So they can have different, uh, photonic crystals with different coupling strength. And you can imagine that F and Delta are parameters that can be varied really easily in our experimental setup because they depend on the input signal that I'm pumping into the particular device. Now, uh, what we want to do, as I said before, is try to understand the bifurcation structure of this system of ODEs and actually try to see and uh, how our results actually relate back to experimental data that this uh, the Alejandro's group can measure, and also how they also relate back to the quantum optical model where this semi-classical approximation actually derives from. Right? Uh, so uh, I'm, to motivate mathematically today's talk, uh, I'm just gonna present you a particular problem and a particular result that we gain out of this particular problem. Uh, here we have, uh, I'm showing you a parameter plane. We have our injection amplitude F and we have uh, delta, which is our detuning. And then I'm fixing my kappa to be equals uh, two, all right? Now, if I were to choose F and delta uh, as indicated by this blue star, and I were to simulate my ODE, I will observe the following. Uh, here I will actually, even, even though I'm pumping symmetrically my, my two cavities, the civil situation that you're gonna find is that at this particular val value, we're gonna have two chaotic attractors. Now, one particular chaotic attractor, which is asymmetrical, is characterized by having, uh, by one of the cavities, in this particular case A, having less light trapped than cavity B. So for all times, uh, in this, if you get attracted to this particular chaotic attractor, uh, one of the cavities always is gonna have more light than the other one. However, the amount of light trapped inside of it is actually moving chaotically, all right? Or changing chaotically in time. Uh, now, because the system is situated to variance, right, and I have this asymmetric situation, then I have to have the opposite situation. What I mean by this is that the situation where A, in which is I'm just simple, uh, showing you here, where uh, A has actually more light trap than B, all right? So basically I have in this particular situation, two chaotic attractors that are isolated in phase space. Now, if I were to do, if I were to change my parameter values to the ones that I'm indicating now in this star, and I were to simulate again, then I have, I find something completely different. Yes, I find a chaotic attractor. However, in this particular case, what you can see is that we're gonna have periods where one of the cavities, for example, A is gonna have less light trap than cavity B. Now, at, at unpredictable times, actually this situation is gonna change and we're gonna actually have periods where A actually has more light trap than B. And this switching between who is having more light than the other one actually is occurring unpredictable times. So basically what we're observing here is like a chaotic switching that is being uh, 
uh, caltic switching between which uh, caltic attractor is trapping more light. Uh, mathematically, uh, as some people might realize, uh, this means that we have a, a, a transition when these two caltic attractors kind of merge and become this symmetrical caltic attractor. And this is called a symmetry increasing bifurcation of chaotic attraction. Now, what I want to motivate uh, this talk with is like now I want to understand, or we wanted to understand, what are the geometrical uh, objects in phase space to allow me to explain this particular transition? And can I use, for example, auto to actually compute the locus of the curving parameter plane that allows me to explain this particular transition? All right. Um, now, as a clue of where to start or how this transition might have occurred, we found out that closer by these parameter values, we can find a, a, a chilical application of chaotic type, uh, which is represented here by this gray curve. Uh, what I mean by this, uh, by this chilical application curve is that if I were to pick a point along, in uh, if I were to pick a point along this curve, uh, my system of differential equations are going to exhibit bisymptotic solution to a subtle equilibrium solution. So here I have a subtle equilibrium that I'm calling P. This subtle equilibrium P is symmetric in the sense that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the field trapping cavity A is equal to the field trapping cavity B. Uh, now this subtle equilibrium is of, uh, is of subtle type, so it has, a, in this particular case, a three-dimensional stable and a one-dimensional unstable manifold. And as you, some of you know, whenever you have a wild chilling curve application or a chilling curve application, this stable and unstable manifold intersect. And what you're gonna have is the existence of a bicytotic solution that converges to a subtle equilibria. So basically you have a solution that converges backwards in time to the subtle equilibria and then forwards in time to the same subtle equilibria. Now, uh, in particular, this, uh, uh, this bisymptotic solution is asymmetric. So basically, given a particular, uh, period of time, a particular value of time, uh, the intensity of A is different than the intensity of B. So basically, this is a, an asymmetric uh, uh, clinical bifurcation. And because our system is situ equivariant, that will imply that you have to have a panel where the situation between A and B actually changes. So basically here, what I'm showing you on the this publication diagram will be a Chilnikov orbit in phase space. And here will be the panel or the, or, or the other Chilnikov orbit, orbit that comes by the symmetry properties of my, my equations. Now, this is good because now that we have this uh, situ equivalent uh, clinical applications, right, we can actually make use of certain techniques that were introduced by Roberto Barrios, Andre, and Leonid Chilnikov. And these techniques are based on taking the unstable manifold of this uh, symmetric subtle equilibrium, which is one dimensional. And then what you do is that you compute what is called the needed invariant. Uh, what I mean by this is like you pick, uh, and I'm just showing you here. Uh, if I pick parameter values and I take my unstable manifold and I compute it, then my unstable manifold is going to move in phase space in certain way. And then what I'm going to do is just, uh, for example, here I'm just, uh, I'm going to take whenever it reaches a maxima or a minima, and I'm going to uh, create a sequence of plus and minus. So what I mean by this is like, this is my temporal trace. Whenever I get a maxima, I'm going to give it a plus, and then if, if the next iteration I get is another maxima, I'm gonna give another plus. And I keep going with this, uh, for example, in this particular one, I get a minima, then I give it a minus. And I keep going like that until I, I, I form a particular, what is called a needing sequence. Uh, the interesting thing about this object is that close to clinical applications, this needing sequence are actually a topological invariant. It means that uh, they, cannot, uh, they cannot change unless a, a publication has occurred. So basically here, I'm just showing you the another situation if I compute this needing invariant of this unstable manifold, but for different parameter values. If I do the same, uh, if I do the same, uh, if I extract the, the needing sequence from it, I, I, I find that I get a plus one, a plus one, and I follow with a bunch of minus one. And you can see from this and this particular sequence that these things are different. So there must be a bifurcation. There must have been a sequence of bifurcations that allow me to transition from one to another one. All right. So what uh, was introduced by Leonid, Andrea, and, and uh, Roberto Barrios, Andrea, and Leonid Chilnikov is that now you can imagine that I can take my parameter plane. I just say, uh, I just make a one thousand by one thousand grid, 
then I compute this needing sequence, and then I just assign a color to a particular needing sequence, right? So if I do this, I get the following. So here I'm just doing this needing sequence up to 12 symbols. And what you can see right away is that uh, whenever I get a, a particular color, it means that my needing sequence is not changing. And whenever there is a transition between colors, it means that a application, a global application in the, in the form of a wild tunic of application must have occurred. Uh, now, right from the path, you can see right away that my two isolated, uh, uh, my isolated uh, chaotic attractor, which I'm showing here, are outside of this region where this wild technical application can occur. Well, the moment where the symmetry increased uh, are actually in the region where a lot of colors are actually changing. All right, so basically where a lot of these wild technical applications can occur. Now, this gives us a, a little bit of a good idea of what to look for because you can see right away that there must be like a high that bounds the moment where these wild tunic of applications can occur. And also on the side, there must be another application that will explain where is the limit of where they can go from the left. All right. Uh, now, this is the techniques, uh, this is our parameter shipping techniques. They are really nice, but uh, they say now, uh, after having a good idea of where this application might lie, what we do now, at least here in Auckland, because we specialize in this uh, continuation of suitable two point boundary problems. We can now try to use these techniques to identify particular subtle objects and their manifolds and see how they interact. And maybe by identifying the correct uh, intersections and the correct objects, we can actually get a good idea of, of these applications. So just to give you a, a good idea, for example, if I go back to the situation where my two uh, chaotic attractors are isolated and I can find something like this. So here I'm just showing you a face portrait. In particular, here we, uh, I'm showing you two subtle periodic orbits, uh, one gamma naught and the other one gamma naught asterisk. And now gamma naught is a subtle periodic orbit that is asymmetric in, and represents the situation where cavity B uh, is, uh, has more light than cavity A and is actually in a, uh, moving in a periodic motion, right? And gamma naught asterisk is this asymmetric partner. Basically, the, uh, the opposite situation given by the uh, Symmetry properties of the system, where now B has sorry A I think A is trapping more light than B. Now, these two periodic orbits are of subtle type. Uh, so, in particular, they have a three-dimensional stable and a two-dimensional unstable manifold. And what I'm showing you, for example, on the yellow surface, is the uh, two-dimensional unstable manifold of gamma naught. And the interesting thing about this particular object is that we were able to identify that the closure of this unstable manifold is actually containing our chaotic attractor. Now, the surfaces that I'm showing you here are, com are computed without uh, by setting up a, a suitable two-point boundary problem. Uh, and then only, and the nice thing is like by symmetry, right? Uh, this, uh, let's say orange surface is gonna be mapped to this red surface, which correspond to the two-dimensional unstable manifold of gamma no asterisk, which is also, which closure is also containing the other isolated chaotic attractor. Now, if I now move a little bit and then I compute this manifold again, and I compute it in the region where all this wild chunic of application occurs, what I'm gonna see is the following. I'm gonna see that they actually, uh, the unstable manifold gamma knob, which I'm just showing you in this particular plot, is not actually isolated in one part of phase space, it's actually moving close nearby to gamma knob asterisk, all right? Not only that, what we are actually showing you here is that or what we are able to compute numerically without with this uh, uh, two-point boundary problem is like we are able to compute connections basically between my so, uh, the direction of time is the other way around connections between my symmetric solid equilibrium P and gamma naught. Now, what I mean by this is that the two-dimensional unstable manifold of gamma naught is intersecting the three-dimensional stable manifold of my symmetric solid equilibrium P. Now, over here, I'm kind of obviously show you the three-dimensional stable manifold of P because uh, it's really, well, it's impossible to show a three-dimensional object in a three-dimensional figure. But well, uh, even though we, I cannot plot them or I cannot show them to you, I can actually compute the intersection between these objects, which correspond to these heteroclinic connections. Now, this is kind of interesting because it means that at one point, uh, because in the case when these two isolated chaotic attractors uh, existed, uh, this connection didn't exist. So at one point, this three-dimensional stable manifold of P and this three-dimensional unstable manifold of gamma naught has to intersect for a first time. So they have to intersect uh, tangentially at one point. In fact, we can actually set up uh, uh, the, uh, through auto 
by uh, this two point boundary problem. And what we are able to find is that indeed we can get uh, the moment where these two uh, buffer, uh, these two manifolds actually intersect tangentially, and we can actually follow it in parameter plane. And this is the curve that I'm showing you here. The blue surface, the blue curve represents the moment with this three-dimensional stable manifold of P and this two-dimensional stable manifold gamma naught intersect for the first time tangentially. So this is good because in a, right from the bow, we can see that these two, uh, uh, this curve actually is bounding the height, right, of this, of where this wild chain of application can occur. And not only that, if I were to pick a point along the line, this is gonna be the situation that I have. I will have the situation where the unstable manifold gamma naught uh, has this tangent connection to P and uh, by symmetry, I will have the connection also from gamma naught asterisk, uh, gamma naught asterisk to P. And this particular point will represent the moment where these two chaotic attractors are gonna start merging. All right, so I basically, it's a, it's a good approximation, a medical approximation of where this symmetric increase in bifurcation occurs in parameter plane. All right, so this is one uh, this is one bound, the one that is on the top. However, there is another bound on the left, right? What we find over here is that we actually can find this particular, the bifurcation that actually bounds the left side of this, uh, uh, of, of where this chemical bifurcation can occur. And this is correspond to a E2P or a co-dimension one connection between the one dimensional unstable manifold of microbial P and the three dimensional uh, three dimensional stable manifold of gamma. Uh, so basically if I pick a point along this line, I will have a situation like, like this, right? I have a solution trajectory that converges for five percent time to my symmetric saddle equilibrium P and then forwards in time is trying to converge, uh, well, it converges to my saddle, uh, my saddle periodic orbit gamma naught, all right? And obviously by symmetry, which I'm just showing you here in, in base space, uh, now, by symmetry, uh, you have the, uh, also the other connection, the one that connects the other side of the unstable manifold of P with the three-dimensional uh, three stable manifold of gamma naught asterisk, which I'm showing you here. So this is kind of nice because now you have uh, these two curves, right, that is bounding these two different uh, uh, regions where this uh, clinical application can occur. However, you can imagine that they also intersect, as I'm just showing you here. So this is a really interesting situation because in that point, what do you have? You have a, a, a trajectory that is leaving my symmetric equilibrium P is going to gamma naught, and then from gamma naught is going back to P, all right? So basically this is what I'm trying to say here, right? I have a connection, all right, which is given by head that uh, in backwards time goes to P, and then in forward time goes to gamma naught, and then I have a connection from gamma naught that goes that goes back to P. Now, the interesting thing is like the right connection is a co-dimension one connection because it's a connection between a three-dimensional stable manifold and a one-dimensional unstable manifold. Well, the second part of the of, of the trip is a tangential connection which between a three-dimensional stable manifold and a two-dimensional unstable manifold, all right? Now, this kind of setup creates a, a cycle, which, uh, which is, I am just showing you here in a much nicer way. This is called, this is a visualization that we call a compactified time connection plot. So what I'm showing you here is like uh, uh, time, but this, this is a really funny time. It's, it's what we call compactifying time. So what we do with this particular setup is like you can imagine that at integer values, we are gonna put a subtle object. And then in the open intervals, we are gonna actually make the, uh, we're gonna actually put the connections that connects the different subtle objects, right? And this is kind of closely related to how one could see the data from out of, right? So here, for example, I'm just showing you, as I said before, the connection that goes from P that goes to gamma naught, all right? And the connection that goes from gamma naught back to P, all right? Now, this particular connection uh, cycle, and because it's a cycle going from one subtle object to another one, and then from that subtle back to, to this equilibrium point, these are called, uh, the general singular cycle, and they actually obvious that have getting a lot of recent attention because uh, they have been seen as a pro. Uh, um, uh, because close nearby, one can show that a lot of interesting chaotic behaviors can be observed, and this is basically what we're observing here. Uh, this particular point actually uh, is represent uh, is showing where these bounds of clinical applications can occur, uh, and. Later in the talk, I'm going to show you how even the, how we can even co compute the unfolding of this particular point. 
Uh, so this is interesting, right? So we, we go the one pound to the other pound from, from this particular colorful picture, right? But then you, as some of you have not realized, we have also regions where the colors are quite solid, right? So the question is like, well, all right, so what happened here? All right, and this is a really natural question to ask, right? So if I pick a point there, all right, and then I simulate my system, then I have a, a, this interesting situation. Before I have this uh, chaotic switching between chaotic attractors, now what I'm finding is like my unstable manifold of P is actually being attracted to a symmetric periodic orbit. Now, this is an interesting uh, periodic orbit because point-wise is asymmetric in the sense that if I freeze time, uh, the, uh, one of the cavities is gonna have more light than the other one, but as an object on phase space, it's actually symmetric. So it basically doesn't have a panel. Now, the interesting thing about this particular solution is that now my temporal trace is just gonna be a regular switching between uh, one of the cavities having more light than the other one. So from chaotic behavior, I'm going back to regular switching, all right? Now, if I pick another point in, in let's say, for example, the one that I'm showing you here, uh, and I, I simulate, I also find that I still go to the same stable periodic orbit. However, the number of loops that I do before I arrive to it is actually increasing, all right? And that's why my needing sequence changes, all right? If I keep going for the other region, I actually find that indeed, I also get attracted to the same periodic orbit, but uh, I get, I'm doing more loops before I reach these periodic orbits. And that is what is creating the different changes in the uh, let's say in the uh, in the needing sequence, right? Now, now that we have this attracting periodic orbit, uh, another sensible question to ask is uh, where it comes from, right? What where is this curve particularly coming from? Now, uh, by using auto, we can take uh, this particular stable periodic orbit, and then we can find, and this is what I'm showing you here, that actually comes from a subtle no bifurcation of periodic orbits. Now, in this particular subtle no bifurcation of periodic orbits, these uh, a stable periodic orbit that is symmetric actually uh, uh, disappears with a subtle periodic orbit that is also symmetric, all right? And this is kind of interesting because now you can imagine that this subtle periodic orbit that also has a three-dimensional stable manifold and two-dimensional unstable manifold is the one responsible of telling uh, uh, my unstable manifold when to converge to my chaotic attractor or not. What I mean by this is like the stable manifold of this subtle periodic orbit Separates the initial conditions that go, uh, separates the initial conditions where uh, that, for example, goes to a chaotic attractor or goes to this regular switching behavior. All right. So, what I'm showing you here now are the boundaries of these particular uh, regions of solid color. And indeed, what we can show here is that these boundaries are the E2P connections, or at the first time that the unstable manifold of P is actually meeting the three-dimensional stable manifold of this new set of periodic orbit, which we call gamma not s, all right? Now, here you can see that you do two, uh, two loops before I, I, I converge to this set of periodic orbit. If I go to the other um, uh, the, uh, isola of the other region with solid color, I can find that I also get the same connection. However, I now I do three loops before I converge to it, all right? And so I can keep going the same and I can get the next one it should be the other E2P connections, right? So this is kind of nice, right? Because by translating the problem into a geometry problem and finding this kind of intersection between several and several manifold, we can actually find uh, the boundaries of these kind of regions of where we can have this kind of, uh, when the unstable manifold is actually being attracted, attracted to these chaotic attractor. Not only that, and this is the this is a, a, a really good question to also to ask, is, you can also see that there is a high, right? And the question is like, what is the high of this E2P connection? Why this object cannot go uh, higher up, right? And can we actually find in part, uh, another bifurcation that tells me when they actually, what is the limit of where they can, they can arrive, right? And the answer is like, yes, we can actually are able to find the, the particular bifurcation that bounds this E2P connections, and they actually correspond to uh, also a tangency bifurcation between a three-dimensional stable and a three-dimensional unstable manifold. Now, in this particular case, uh, the, uh, the tangency bifurcation is gonna be between the two-dimensional um, unstable manifold of gamma naught S and the three-dimensional stable manifold of uh, uh, gamma naught S, or gamma naught, so basically of the other periodic orbit. Basically what I mean, and this is the, the situation that I'm gonna show here on this particular point, we have a situation uh, like this. I have a connection from P to gamma naught, and then I have a tangent connection between gamma naught and gamma naught S, 
And then I can have a structurally visible connection between gamma naught S and P. Now, the connection between P and gamma naught S is a uh, uh, is, is the intersection between the one-dimensional unstable manifold of P and the three-dimensional stable manifold gamma naught. Uh, the, this part of the trip, all right, the middle part of the trip is my tangential bifurcation, which is, uh, which, uh, which is the tangent bifurcation between the two-dimensional stable manifold gamma naught and the three-dimensional stable manifold gamma naught S. And this last bit of the trip is basically the intersection between the two-dimensional unstable manifold gamma naught S and the three-dimensional stable manifold of P. And this particular bit of the, tra of the trip is actually uh, transversal. So it means that the manifold actually intersecting uh, uh, transversally, so it's actually a connection that persists after, it, it persists after parameter perturbation. Now, what I'm showing you here is the situation along this point, and you can imagine that this is kind of like a, a numerical, like what we find, what we find is like we have numerical evidence that it shows that this particular point is kind of like a generalization of the degenerate singular cycle that we see. And in particular, the interesting thing about this particular publication is that in the previous case, uh, my blue curve F, right, was bounding where my chilling co-publication existed. Now in this particular bit, right, is this bit of the trip, right, that actually bounds the height of my E to P connections, all right, or, my, or this uh, connection between these subtle periodic orbits. Now, uh, if we, uh, this is now the plot uh, as a uh, CTC plot, a compacted five time plot, just to help you visualize here. So I have a connection that leaves P, goes to gamma naught, then I have a connection that is tangent going to gamma naught S, and the last bit of my trip, the connection goes back to P in a transversal way, all right? Um, the nice thing about this now is like, uh, uh, you can imagine now that when I'm in this region, right, uh, my periodic orbit is stable. I, my, I'm being attracted to this stable periodic orbit. However, it can also exhibit other type of applications. And what we have found is like it actually goes through a symmetry increasing, uh, sorry, a, semi, a symmetry breaking bifurcation where it creates two asymmetric periodic orbits. Each asymmetric periodic orbit is gonna go to a period doubling cascade. And we can actually see if I were to pick a point below this period doubling cascade, a situation where we have a new type of chaotic behavior where uh, the intensity of light is fluctuating uh, uh, chaotically uh, um, in each cavity. However, the, the way that it switches is regularly, right? So you don't have this kind of chaotic switching, you are actually regularly switching between these objects, all right? Not only that, if I go a little bit further to the region where, again, colors are, uh, where clinical applications can occur, we find that actually these two chaotic attractors kind of merge, the ones that existed before with this new one, and then you have periods where you are chaotically switching, and then periods where you have regular switching behavior, all right? and just to make this story short, uh, we can, by identifying the correct uh, manifolds and subtle, subtle objects in phase space, we can actually delimit the regions where a lot of these transitions actually occur. All right. And not only that, we can actually, um, and this is what I'm going to show now, we can actually now use our uh, uh, this type of analysis and try to understand where chaotic attractors can be observed by this unstable manifold. So here right now, what I'm showing you is the, is the Lyapunov exponent, the first Lyapunov exponent of my uh, computer from my unstable manifold, right? So I, I, I separate, uh, I do this also parameter sweeping. I do a 1000 by 1000 grid and I compute the uh, first Lyapunov exponent. And if, if my first Lyapunov exponent is bigger than, uh, bigger than zero is positive, then I'm gonna color it orange, right? And basically what I'm showing you here is like all these global application uh, phenomena actually delimit uh, regions where we can find out of when this simple manifold can actually see this chaotic behavior, all right? Uh, now, interesting, and this is something that we found out uh, at one point we thought it was just numerical artifacts, but you can see right away that some of these color uh, regions are actually quite solid. So, uh, and some of the other regions are actually quite spotty. At one point we thought that this might be something that are just numerical artifacts because we didn't simulate long enough. However, what we found out is that it was actually not a numerical flow. And then we actually can find a, a, a bifurcation that separates a, a transition when these chaotic attractors are more easily accessible or they can be found more easily by simulations than, than places where they are not. 
and this is related to uh, a transition what people call a, a boundary crisis of, of chaotic attractors. And in particular, what we found is, is that this curve or this bifurcation is related to the uh, attendance bifurcation of gamma naught with itself. And we can actually trace that this bifurcation. And what we find is that most of these curves are actually coming from this degenerate singular cycle. And this actually forces us to actually more or less kind of understand what was exactly happening there. And, and this is more or less what I'm trying to say uh, here. If I were to pick a point here in the solid region, I would be accumulated to one of my chaotic attractors. Well, if I go into a region uh, where it's more spotty, I'm actually gonna be attracted to a symmetric equilibrium in this particular case. So by studying the unfolding of this publication, we actually found out uh, that actually can tell us a little bit about uh, where we can find this, uh, uh, this chaotic behavior, at least when the ensemble manifold can actually see this, uh, this type of application. So what I'm showing you here on the, on the left is basically a theoretical unfolding as, 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 as proven by a paper by Vivian here and, and collaborators in, 2000, uh, in science in 2009. And what I'm showing you here on the left is just basically the numerical unfolding as we can compute it with auto. So in this particular bifurcation, what I'm showing you here on the, on the left, right? This curve over here represents a tangency bifurcation between the ansible manifold of the solar periodic orbit uh, with the with its stable manifold. Basically, you have a, a a connection that converges backwards and forwards in time to this uh, uh, solar periodic orbit, and these other curves are secondary tangency bifurcations, right, coming from this bifurcation. What we can do in Austria is like we can actually find these tangency bifurcations, and we can actually get this numerical unfolding. And what I'm showing you here is basically what what we look. What, what does the numerical funding of looks if we actually do a uh, nonlinear transformation that uh, makes the uh, basically the agrees with the unfolding with this particular vertical uh, uh, unfolding. And the nice thing is that this is the first time that this, part, that this particular unfolding has actually been computed numerically in a, in a four dimensional system of differential equations. And, and this is kind of nice because it was the first time and we were like, wow, this is it. And it actually agrees with the, what the theory tells you. So just to keep a little bit of an intuition of what is happening, uh, I'm gonna pick a, par a parameter value here and I'm gonna increase and decrease my parameter value just to see uh, what is exactly happening here. And if I do that, uh, you can imagine here, what I'm tracing now is a homoclinic orbit to this, uh, uh, to this out of periodic orbit. And what you can see right, right, right from the get-go is that this homoclinic orbit, which is transversal, become, when it becomes tangent, right, it's just gonna fall. And then when it goes back to, for example, to this side, it's gonna fall again, and then it's gonna fall again, and so on. And then it's kind of interesting because when people, it, for the experts, right, when people uh, compute uh, chilling applications, right, one cheap way of computing chilling applications is, is to use the periodic orbit. Uh, take a high period, and if the chilling bifurcation is of wild type, you're going to have this oscillatory behavior as the period increases. Now, what we have here is something that kind of resembles the same situation, where we take a, 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 a homoclinic orbit to a solar periodic orbit, and then by doing continuation, what we see is the same os oscillatory behavior, but instead of accumulating to a chilling bifurcation, it actually accumulates to a heteroclinic cycle. In this particular case, it's gonna be a heteroclinic cycle between a, a structure with several connection and a co-dimension one connection. Uh, so uh, by doing this now, we can have a good idea of where this kind of chaotic, uh, this boundary crisis can occur. And, and basically tell us a little bit more that, uh, is, uh, or let's say it shows the power of combining these kind of parameter sweeping techniques with these continuation techniques, just to get a really good, uh, a characterization of the kind of chaotic behavior that one can observe in a particular system. Um, now, an, a sensible question to ask is that I just shown you a particular place of parameter plane, but some might ask where are these curves coming from? And in particular, we can find that there are two responsible uh, co-dimension two points that actually explains the uh, where these curves are coming from. Uh, one of these points, uh, which I'm showing you here, is a uh, Going here. One of these points, sorry, it's moving here. 
right? One of these points uh, is a peak of T point, which corresponds to a, 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 cycle, a heterogeneous cycle between two saddle equilibria. And, uh, and this particular peak of T point uh, is actually uh, responsible for the creation of the heterogeneous cycles, sorry, the heterogeneous uh, bifurcation, the co-dimension one connections connecting to, the, to these saddle periodic orbits, and also the chilical bifurcation points. And the nice thing is like we can actually find the bounds also on the left and right of where these wild technical bifurcations can occur. And the other point that we find is a flip bifurcation point, which corresponds when uh, uh, when the stable manifold of a saddle equilibria changes from uh, orientable to non-orientable. In particular, we can find that this particular flip bifurcation point is responsible for the creation of all these tangency bifurcations. And what you are seeing here basically is an interaction between these, uh, a global interaction between the unfolding of these two co dimension two points and how this uh, interaction between all these curves emanating from this co dimension two point actually rearranges parameter plane. Uh, so if someone is more interested, uh, I would recommend you guys to to or it's more interested on this kind of stuff. Uh, most of these results are already published and, and you can find it in this particular paper. Uh, now, uh, I started this, uh, or I started motivating this entire talk about a particular experimental setup. Uh, so the question is like, all right, so what about the experimental setup again? So at the moment we, uh, uh, Alejandro's group has done experiments and where we have actually started with the most simple application, for example, symmetry, uh, symmetry breaking and some application. And what we have found is like there is a good agreement between experimental and theoretical predictions. Uh, so some of these results are already are in the archive. So if someone is interested, they can also see it. Uh, and also another side of this work is that we also wanted to compare about the quantum, uh, the quantum optical model. And we have done some preliminary results, which we have also, uh, so uh, we, we, you can also find the archive where we actually find, uh, trying to see how much signatures of this semi-classical approximation can be observed back into the quantum optical model. And obviously uh, this is like a, like a bigger, like a more bigger question that we want to tackle at one point is that uh, now that we know that there is semi-classical chaos in this particular system of OTEs, right? How is this behavior actually being, um, uh, or what is the or what is the fingerprint of this behavior when we go back to this quantum optical model? Uh, and with this, I, I think I would I would like to finish the talk. And I know thank you very much for for inviting me. And that's it. Thank thank you, Andrews. Thank you. Um, so that 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 was that was very interesting. That was very amazing. The the way you have. Um, Basically, gone through all those curves in the in the phase space. Yeah. So let's see. Um, so you can so for the audience, you can simply just unmute yourself to ask questions, or if you want, you can also put your question in chat, and I I will read it for Andrews to answer. Um, okay. So and okay. So while while the audience is thinking about the. Uh, so think about the questions. So there, there are a couple of things I wanted to ask. Um, so, so one of them was that. Um, so towards the end, you talk about some experiments, and then um, the, the, in the beginning, when you start off with your with your model, you have you have the same pump uh, yeah. parameters, right? So both the tuning, but perhaps there was also f. That was I don't know if which, which one is more important, but. Um, how, so, so these these uh, these structures in the phase space that you observe and compute, how how sensitive are they to uh, the values of f not, for example, being the same? Uh, yeah. So you're basically how much of a symmetry is there in the actual experiment? Uh, yes, that and also yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so right now this is uh, at least the at least the 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 two system are closely to be symmetrical. Obviously this is an experimental setup. Mm -hmm. So it's really, yeah, it's really hard to get the, the symmetrical, the symmetric case in this, uh, like the perfect symmetrical case. However, even with the, with, uh, however, the, the, the asymmetry is quite low and you can see, at least from what we have observed from the, maybe this is a much better way to hear, like some of the most 
easy to observe and here mm -hmm. we can actually see. Like, for example, here on the left, I'm just showing you, for example, where the fish of application occurs. So mm -hmm. basically where symmetry breaking occurs for the on first the left time. Side, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and sorry, yeah, on, on the right is the theoretical case. And then on the left, you can see that they can actually yeah. observe uh, at least uh, when they check the experimental data that this object actually symmetry break at that point. And uh, they can also have observed feasibility of symmetric states. And, and in fact, this is a good question. At one point, even the most complicated behavior, for example, the symmetry increasing of application of chaotic attractors, right? Uh, you can imagine that this is, and this is something that we have uh, talked to them. It might be the responsible of why there are certain regions in this particular case where they cannot even pinpoint exactly what is happening because you can imagine that now you have experimental mm. data and then you, if you have something that is chaotically switching, right? It's really hard to see if that thing is symmetry breaking. So that's why they cannot paint the blue, sorry, or purple or if it's, mm -hmm. or it's in a bicycle regime, right? So, um, yeah, so but the, the experimental setup yeah. is quite close to, to being symmetric. Nice. Yeah. Okay. okay, okay, so, okay, I see. Yeah. All right, and, and so um, there, there was something, um, so let me just double check chat before I, I before I continue with some questions. Okay, so, so that, that's good. Um, so, so do you have the, um, you have this actually, I answered this, yes. Um, there, 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 was, there was something uh, interesting in when, when you were looking at the, in the beginning when you were interested in the Shilnikov uh, uh, bifurcation and the needing. Yeah, right? the needing sequence. Yes, yeah, so, so you, you were showing something and it looks like you're, you're pointing at points where the curve, like it, it didn't, or at least in the phase space, it didn't look like it's a maximum or minimum. It looked like it's yeah. a maximum curvature, if I understand correctly. Uh, yeah, so basically what they do, and this is more or less- it was based towards on, the, uh, yeah. And it's kind of based on the theory, right? Uh, you know, whenever you have a chinical bifurcation, right? Uh, especially uh, uh, one that can create chaotic, uh, multi, sorry, one that can create multi-loop chinic, uh, for a multi-loop uh, uh, homoclinic applications nearby, uh, you can imagine that given a particular structure, right? Uh, if you're gonna get a clinical application nearby, it should look the same, but the number of loops should, should, should differ, right? So by checking this plus and minus, what you are technically doing is actually counting the loops, like how many loops uh, are you doing when uh, B is bigger than A? Uh, how many loops are you doing when uh, A is larger than B, all right? Okay, and that's why, so basically when you go plus, plus, minus, minus, you're basically saying you're doing three loops uh, in this particular region, so phase space, and then you're doing three loops on the other one, all right? And just by abusing this kind of technique, right? And it's also related with the curvature of how, how these manifolds are, are, are curving over there. But uh, let's say when you're checking these loops, right, um, it's a really cheap way to actually see how these clinical applications should organize themselves, right? And this is something that uh, I think it was Roberto Barrio and Leonita and Andrei Chineco realized whenever they implemented these techniques for the first time in the Lorentz equation. And okay, and then there, there's, let me just double check. So I think I can go, I can go with one more if there's time. Um, so there, there was, um, so did you were also mentioning about symmetry increasing bifurcations. Can, yep. can you, can you, the, the, Say a bit more about that one. I, I, I'm not very familiar with the symmetry. Uh, so normally when people, what is what I'm talking about. So you check the literature, right? And this is something that, that people talk about a lot, right? Uh, you can imagine that uh, these chaotic attractors, right? And that's why they're isolated in space space and they are asymmetric, right? Mm -hmm. So. Now, what they call symmetric increasing is like you can imagine that after I go here, the two chaotic attractors are actually merged, right? And they, and and in a way, uh, the the chaotic attractor at the set in phase space, right, has more symmetry. All right, because it's actually going to, uh, if, if you if you apply the the, uh, the this permutation of of, of sides, right, you end up in the same chaotic attractor. So that's the basic idea. All right. Uh, so basically, when 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 a chaotic attractor gains more symmetry, all right. Uh, um, through a fabrication, that's what people call symmetry increasing fabrication, right? And this is uh, uh, basically I was telling you a little bit about F. So you can imagine that F is a numerical approximation of where this symmetry fabrication, symmetry increasing fabrication actually occurs. So at this, basically this transition, this point is the transition between having two isolated chaotic attractors 
where one cavity has more light than the other one, and then you have the other case where one is chaotically switching between the two. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So um, okay. Yeah. So I I know I know I, even like even you know um, I guess uh, for for even one like point to cycle connection or things like setting up setting up even like a one of those things in as boundary value problem itself is not easy but then you're you're doing all these other like, more complicated ones here so it's quite impressive. <laughs> no, no, not only that it's not only that it's complicated because it's it's really nice because it's actually a, a bridge from really theoretical results, right? Because we, when do you can find a the general singular cycle theoretically, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to even prove that you can actually get it. But with these techniques, right, you can actually get this particular, where these objects can actually exist, right? And not only you can actually numerically compute the application um, curves that comes from this co-dimension two points and not only that actually connect them to, to actually things that people can observe, right? Because at one point is yeah, how, yeah. how this actually related back to something that these experimentalists can observe, right? Yeah, yeah, and and, and do then do do you observe A in the experiments or? The... No, at the moment no. Yeah. At the moment, at the moment no, because right now they are uh, well, they, they're also improving their their particular experimental setup, so they're trying to to increase the uh, decrease the uh, increase the frequency at which they can sample. So the, you know there is a lot of compl uh, complications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, just, A itself just is an envelope amplitude. If I yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, let's say that they cannot sample, uh, they uh, let's say the, they cannot measure uh, the way that they sample, right? It's, it's a problem of sampling, right? And okay. right now they, they're actually improving the way that they can sample actually the experimental data. Mm. Uh, but even in the, let's say, and that's why we started the, the work of the work, right? It's more related to more easy or observable behavior, for example, steady states and so on. But for example, there are other groups with other experimental setups where they can actually observe, for example, periodic oscillations also in this model in, in different settings. So it's not that far fetched to think in the future even even these things can be actually more observed more more readily. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right, great, thank you. all right, great, thanks. So let me just double check. So is there any if there's any more any questions from the audience? Uh, okay, so. Um, so thank, thanks again, uh, Andrews. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I think Damien, you can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrews. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation.